Good morning. Welcome back to Coffee with Toffees, guys. It is uh, This is the show that will air on the 12th, but we're recording a little bit early because uh, our special guest has the day off today, so I thought what better way to give him a nice relaxing day off than to exploit that vacation by making him come on the show and chat with us here. As you know, you can find me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. You can find all of our uh, podcasts, RSS feeds, and everything over on SoundCloud. And if you want to support the show, patreon.com slash Toffees. We're releasing the new t-shirt, so make sure you get there and follow so that you get a sweet t-shirt when it comes out. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our guest today, Peter PPD. Do you say the last name Dagger? Yes, Dagger. Dagger, excellent. Joining us all the way from, uh, are you still in Fort Wayne, Indiana? Little old Fort Wayne, Indiana. Little old Fort Wayne, Indiana here to uh, just chat a little bit about probably not what you're expecting and maybe a little bit of what you are. So we've got some Reddit questions, we've got some Twitter follow-ups, uh, but we also have some new stuff. As you know, my interviews are always uh, focused on the player and maybe parts of them that you just don't know. So thanks for agreeing to be here today, PPD. Yeah, sure. I've heard great things about the show, so Thank you. I, mean, I, I occasionally like to do an interview, so I figured, what the hell, let's do it. I dig it. Would you rather me call you Peter or PPD for the course of the interview? Oh, that's a tough question. Like, I, I hate when casters say Peter when they're casting, but mm -hmm. it's, it's more of like a personal interview, so I think I, I think it might be okay if you want. Uh, all right, I'll test. I'll go both ways. I'll go. I'll, I'll go in and out. It'll be fun. Um, so before we get into Dota-based questions, well, first I wanted to open up the interview by, interview by saying, "What's happening?" Uh, because I've watched so many replays, and you love to say that when things are going wrong in a game. <laughs> so it's my favorite. But that that said, before we go into the Dota stuff, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that I think are pertinent. And the first one's probably the most important to me of the entire interview. And is it living in Fort Wayne? Are you a Colts fan? I'm not, I'm not a Colts fan. That's I, sad. I'm not the biggest NFL fan. Like I've always I've always watched football. I've always liked watching football, mm -hmm. but I've never like really connected to a team. Okay. No, I completely understand that. I, uh, I, I have lived in Indianapolis for a long time, so I can't help it. I'm an Irish fan, so Notre Dame. Notre so Dame. That makes more sense. More of a college football kind of guy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's right, that's right around your neck of the woods, so that makes, it makes perfect sense. So for those of you who don't know, um, PBD is from the Midwest, lives in Fort Wayne, which is a town about two and a half hours north of the capital in Indiana. Uh, Midwestern boy, born, bred, and brought up from what I understand. So you've li you've lived your entire life among the corn stalks. Is this true? I mean, I live in suburbia, but I guess if you, you know, if you drive a little bit, you know, outside where I live, you might see a couple cornfields. Okay. And uh, here's a question that was uh, posed to me by the producer of the show. He said, do you have any tattoos? And if so, what are they? I think that's more of like a joke thing. I think initially when I joined EG, there was a part of my bio that said like, ask me what, what is tattooed on my chest, but I actually don't have any tattoos and I think I'm a little too much of a, too much of a little girl to get one for now. Nice. I completely, I keep meaning to go to, go to, I keep meaning to get one and then, uh, yeah, me too. Me convince too. myself I it's going to hurt too much. I just don't, I just don't have the time, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. a busy boy. I can't get there. I understand completely. So, uh, let's see. Let's move forward. So when you're not doing Dota, which I imagine is a copious amount of your time, what is your favorite non-gaming related time sink? Oh, um, probably watching TV shows, I guess. Okay. I, I, that's not that uh, unique, but I really like to watch a, a good TV show. I don't watch many movies. I like the long TV shows so I can really connect with like characters and stuff like that. Okay. So I, I completely respect that. Love watching the shows. Do you have a favorite show that you enjoy watching or that you're addicted to right now? Oh, I watch a lot. Um, probably my favorite out right now is probably The League, the fantasy mm. football one. Yeah, it's a good um, one. It's, this, this season's a little questionable, but I really like the first couple. Um, I just watched The Walking Dead. I'm trying mm. to stay up on that. Um, I was watching Mob City, which got like discontinued after like three episodes, but it's like they're each like hour and a half episodes, and they were really really good. So I, I heard, I heard they were good. Yeah, they were they were phenomenal. I, I was really disappointed that they aren't getting me anymore. Game of Thrones fan? Yeah, 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 I definitely watch Game of Thrones. I mean, I'm a fan of good TV shows, so I, I watch everything except for I, I can't really get into The Wire, which everyone keeps telling me to watch. Mm. But maybe someday if I get really bored. It feels a bit too old school for me. I, I, I do the same thing. They keep saying watch it, and I get stuck watching something else instead. All right, so um, let me ask you this. This is a good one. Transition into the Dota talk. What was the first video game that you remember really getting into? Um, when I was a kid, one of my one of my first Christmas presents was the N64. Mm -hmm. And I really got into Mario 64. Um, nice. 
had a babysitter who was this girl and for some odd reason she was just or at least to me she was like the master of n64 or uh, mario 64 so i would like i'd be playing and she'd just like i mean she had the easiest job ever she just watched me play mario 64 all night as her job right um and then i would be like oh i can't beat this please come help me and i forget her name but um <laughs> Yeah, that, that was the game I really got into, and I was all about, you know, getting the uh, 120 stars or something. Nice. So, A, I want to say great choice of game, and B, I want to say that makes me feel ridiculously old, since I my first gaming system was the Atari. Uh, oh, yeah. So, well, you know, what are you going to do? This is eSports for you. Uh, that said, I know you live in Fort Wayne. Uh, have you considered making a move out of that area because of the pro career, or is it in this industry it's easy enough that you can kind of work from Fort Wayne without any issues uh, I think it's definitely easy enough mm -hmm. uh, but I have considered moving around um, eventually you know if I stay with EG I'll probably end up at some point in San Francisco if I mm -hmm. decide to maybe do something else other than play video games Okay. I'll probably find something out there also Twitch is out in San Francisco which could be a nice place to maybe start a career Yeah. Um, but you know, that's pretty much it. I'm not, I'm not opposed to really moving anywhere. I, I love the city. I love New York. I love L.A., San Francisco. I don't love L.A. that much, but San Francisco, Chicago, mm -hmm. those are all great cities. And I, I could move out there, but for now, I just, um, I'm just i pretty comfortable living in Fort Wayne with a couple of friends. And I, I travel all the time, so it's kind of just like a little bit of a headquarters I come back to and relax. Yeah. Well, I'm sure living with friends is is got to be nice because you sort of – you're living in a career in a world where you are traveling all over the place. You have this weird rock star status, I imagine, when you're at events. But then when you go to your daily life, I'm sure you don't get recognized a lot in the street. Or or am I wrong and you get picked up all the time? Oh, and nobody recognizes okay. me at all. Like, it's, it is totally, yeah, it's exactly how you described it. Um, you know, events, I'm like, really cool guy. And then, you know, back home, it's just like, I'm just some random schmuck. And I tell people I play video games for a living and they laugh at me. So that actually segues to my next question. I um I lived in Indiana for a very long time. I think we might even be going back there in the near future. I never found it to be a place that was particularly friendly to gamers in the, you know, quote unquote gamers. I would say in their more traditional sense of loving sports above all else. Uh, was it difficult, or what was your journey to pro esports like in that environment? Um, it's a tough question. I think doing esports in the u.s anywhere is pretty difficult uh, mm -hmm. i think maybe california is a little more accepting just because of how ahead of the age they are just mm -hmm. in general just with everything um but like especially like in the midwest like nobody really approved of what i was doing mm -hmm. and it took you know it took a long time for even my parents to get behind it and my friends you know they're just just now coming around to the whole idea like they can't believe it's actually i'm not sure like I think most of them understand because they actually watch mm -hmm. and they you know, I've explained it to them enough but like like the people that I know that aren't like my best friends like they right. still are just very skeptical right. um, very disapproving to say put it lightly I think well it was always hard when I, I I played some other games competitively and you would say they you know your friends would call you and say let's go get a drink or let's go to a movie and you would say mm, I've got a game tonight and oh, I had yeah. to explain that it was a video game is that that's pretty much been your experience essentially yeah, so that that was more of like a high school thing for me because mm -hmm. I had, I had my two groups of friends in high school where I had my friend I played football, soccer, wrestling. I was like this like I had like this like jock life, and then okay. I had this nerdy life where I had like this whole other group of friends where we'd like get together and play Super Smash for six hours straight or something. <laughs> so it was like, um, it was very torn in between the two, and I would be like at home playing, and then my friends would call me and say, "Hey, let's go, let's go to a movie or go to dinner or mm -hmm. go do something or." And I'd be like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really up to it tonight, right? I don't feel yeah. like it. But then they're like, oh, then they're like, are you just playing video games? I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they pegged you. That's the worst. Um, ah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, shit, it's just been awesome in the first place. Uh, so let me ask you this. It sounds like you had uh, your sports thing going for you. I know that you looked at some college uh, and started playing casually initially. At what point... Did you look at your casual gaming career and say to yourself, well, wait a minute, I, I could potentially do this as a thing? Okay, so I've always been super competitive like in gaming, like, but I never really thought it would be like a career. Like, so I never thought, like, I always looked at like StarCraft players, and I was like, holy crap, that's awesome that they're playing the game for a living. But I didn't really play any games that were, that were like that. I mean, I played some things that were maybe a little similar, 
but in general I was just well I didn't really expect to be able to turn it into a career so I was just playing you know I was playing casually but at the same time I was very very competitive about it I was very serious about it like even though even if it was just for fun I still wanted to be the best and beat everyone mm -hmm. um so it was probably my I'm gonna say the summer of between my freshman and sophomore year of college that I really just kind of said hey you know I'm making you know I just want some money or hey I can make money doing this so let's let's go for it Nice. So, and you, I think you said you took a year off when you started playing professionally in Han, and uh, then went back to school. And sort of, what's the status of that now? No, no. I, I played two years in like my uh, sophomore and junior year I, of college. I played and went to school at the same time. Uh, more towards the end of my junior year, it really started to kind of like sidetrack me from my studies. So like my grades kind of started slipping, and I wasn't able to like attend a class all the time because I was you know constantly saying. Oh, I have a match today, or oh, I have practice, or my team really needs. Especially when you're in this like, um, it's really hard to you know reschedule matches or you work practice around for the people when you're just like a starting player and you're not mm -hmm. established. Like you have to put so much time aside in order to get good at the game, and you have to put all that time aside to commit yourself because um, your schedule has to work with four other people and. Right. You know, they have their own lives as well, so it's 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 very difficult for someone in North America with just how like the time zones and how all the tournaments work to really mm -hmm. get into it, which I think is one of the bigger problems with the undeveloped underdeveloped um, NA scene, where all of the, like the big tournaments, where all the mm -hmm. best competition is, there's always on European time. Right. So middle of the day, absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Um, so you you did that for Han, and then you. After you left Han, so we won't talk too much about the Han days. Um, if you guys are interested, there's some actually really good articles. If you just go ahead and Google PPD Dota or HON, uh, you can find some really good background on that. But after you came over, you joined up with Stay Free for a while, played with them. And I think the first place that, for instance, I got to see you make a massive impact uh, was with the Super Strong Dinosaurs. And there was, I think it was Star Ladder 7. You guys had a really great performance there. And then it sort of dissipated. You guys all went your own way. But before we talk about the transition to Sad Boys, I want to know what was the SSD experience like for you? Um, yeah, I would love to talk about Stay Free as well. I think that was hmm. a very interesting team. But I can, I can start with the SSD if you'd like. No, let's start with Stay Free and then we'll run our way. Let's just run our way right through your career so far. Okay, so when I switched over to Dota, I was still um, split in between Han as well. Like mm -hmm. we were playing the Han Tour season two, I think, with like uh, not complexity. Because complexity dropped us when right. Moonander left. Um, so it was like me, B Kid, Trouf, Zai, and mm -hmm. Riser, and it was um, we kept like splitting time in between the two, and eventually it it came to me just saying, hey guys, I'm not going to play Han anymore. I want to go to Dota. I'm tired of all this stuff and tired of you know getting shit from the community because mm -hmm. I'm trying to do two different things at once. So I said to hell with it, and I switched over to uh, Dota and started playing. I made my own team with Stay Free, which was initially <coughs> myself, Tralfmador, mm -hmm. or Tralf, he's a cast name D2L, um, Zai, Enso, um, and... Originally, it was Heimer just because we needed the fifth, but mm -hmm. it ended up we found. I asked a ton of different people, but we ended up settling on Corey, okay. who's currently playing with Zephyr. And we just started playing a lot, and we had five players. Had... Enzo is um, kind of on the fence. He's always been a good friend and a mm -hmm. great player, but he's always been very um, unreliable, I think is probably the best word. Okay. So it's very tough to you know develop a team around that. Right. But yeah, so we started playing a lot, and then I think for that team got into big troubles during the when I got on offer from Dignitas to join mm -hmm. their team, and I did this like this whole tryout phase, and I said, "Hey guys, I have this great opportunity to join a professional Dota team. I'm gonna do this tryout," and they were like, "Oh, that's awesome! Like you should totally do it." And that's and that was you know that was something that our team was okay with saying, which was really really cool. Yeah, and you know I ended up joining Dignitas you know temporarily for like a month, and then and, um. We were playing MLG qualifiers, and we ended up both getting into the playoffs, and they ended up um, qualifying to go to Full Sail, which is where I was supposed to go to with Dignitas, mm -hmm. and at that, when it was time to like book tickets and stuff, they ended up booting me that day, 
Oh, wow. So, which is a very similar experience for me. It's happened before. It's very unfortunate. I was devastated. And um, so I tried to get back on to stay free, and, you know, they wanted to have me. And they were playing with uh, they were playing with our manager, um, meanwhile, like, while I was in my stead. And, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't go because MLG Full Sail was only providing, like, $2,000 for stipend or something. Oh, wow. And we had two Europeans, so it was, like, too much of a ticket cost to get everyone there. So we ended up, they ended up not going. And they gave their they gave their spot away, the day before I came back to the team and said, "Hey, I can play with you guys because I got booted." Hmm. So and at that point it was too late to get the spot back and we lost out on that opportunity and that team kind of dissolved from that point on. I think qualifying for MLG is something that we really wanted to do as a team. Right. Not fulfilling that goal kind of, um, you know, made our you know, our end game goal a little a little foggy, a little blurry. Absolutely. So that, so that sounds tough, and then from there it was... Yeah, continue, so, I'm sorry, continue. So I was getting a lot of offers from European teams. I think he had hmm. maybe um, the Danish team, Life, or... I forget who they were at the time. Maybe it was Mouse or something like that. Okay. Um, they wanted him to join up as like their mid-player or something. And you know, me and Zai have always been pretty buddy-buddy mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, they were able to like really trust each other and be open about everything not really go behind each other's back so he was always like in the you know always keeping me informed about what was going on with his you know situation mm -hmm. and he came to me about an opportunity to join super strong dinosaurs with snake king come with me and arise yeah they wanted to replace mini bambo with mm -hmm. me and i so he he thought that would be the best opportunity for us and i wasn't about to say no um for, I first off, I didn't want to lose playing with Zai because I know that he would, you know, eventually become the star that he is now, right? Dota, and you know, just kind of like ride his curtails to the top. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we went there, and you know, the team actually we we did really well. We had some great tournaments, um, you know, some pretty good placements for new players like myself and Zai, who you know, it was it was our first splash into like top tier Dota, mm -hmm. and. You know, we just had big attitude issues. Like you could imagine, snaking our eyes and come with me and myself. As, yeah. You know, people are gonna bash heads, and I think the biggest problem was that <coughs> come with me just wasn't. His character is just not acceptable for a Dota team. His attitude. He constantly um, blaming me behind my back, hmm. and he was like, he was talking to Zai, and like, you know, Zai's gonna tell me so that started happening Zai informed me of that and then I left the team and then he left the team and we took about a month break and then we got the offer to try out for Evil Geniuses. Wow so that really worked out um I, I mean I'll be honest I was sad when SSD stopped playing together at the back end of the Star Ladder because uh I loved watching what you guys were doing um though when you formed up Sad Boys so did you guys get the offer from EG prior to the formation of Sad Boys or was it sort of a create a team see how it goes and then maybe EG will be interested um well it was a little bit of the create a team see how it goes okay maybe EG will be interested but it was I mean it was you know EG would be interested if we were mm -hmm. good kind of thing right like it was fear was making the team with RTZ and those two were like all, already signed so mm -hmm. they were going to EG no matter what. It was just who was going to be the last three. Interesting. So it, it, and that's something I think a lot of folks don't realize necessarily about how some of the sponsorships work. That I'd like to see these sort of test teams running before the actual signing process. Um, did you guys have a reason behind picking Sad Boys as a name? Oh, it was a youngling thing. Like, okay, Zai is like, Zai, okay. If you ever watch Zai stream, he listens to the weirdest music ever, <laughs> and him and our tour buddies and they're both you know little kiddos so mm -hmm. he said Zai sends him funny music all the time and our tour really picked it up as well and started playing it on his stream all the time so it became a thing and sad boys was just something to um you know brand yourself as temporarily just for fun nice so at this point uh when you joined up with sad boys you took over the drafting from fear how did that take place was that like a day one you're going to be the drafter? Was this kind of an organic transition? Like, tell me, walk me through that process. Because Fear's sort of, like, been around forever. Was there a stress involved with that as, as well? No, not at all, actually. Um, hmm. You know, because Fear's been so around for so long and played for so many teams, he understands how important it is to have a focused leader who wants to lead. 
mm-hmm. and that is something that I brought to the team, and that's probably one of the reasons why they wanted to try me out initially because they knew I had this um, controlling, um, very confident approach to the game. Like I was very outspoken about how I believe that my way of playing Dota was the best way of playing Dota, and that if mm-hmm. people listen to me, then we will win. And it sounds kind of like you know, <coughs> kind of an asshole, which I kind of am, or I definitely am. But if it, if it leads to us winning games, then you know, that's really the end goal of everyone here. So along that lines, uh, Pocket just actually posted this in Twitch chat. It says, "Do you feel like your team pioneered that sort of six point eight one pre TI four meta in in that sense of you brought something strong and different to the scene?" I think we brought the whole idea of putting a, not putting your carry in the safe lane is something like when I started when they asked they started asking me to try out um, the EG and I I, I already talked talked to Arthur previously about how much I wanted to play with him and how I had all these ideas for his you know his particular play style <coughs> and um, just putting like the, your carry mid or you know just switching it up and being very fluid with your lanes and heroes is something that a lot of teams don't do which mm-hmm. they're starting to do now, starting to do now which they're almost forced to do now and um, it just you know keeps your opponents guessing, and it you know get even a little bit of advantage in the laning phase can you know lead your team to or result in a victory. Absolutely. So uh, Sad Boys becomes EG. EG bursts onto the scene. You guys had a really big win um, against C9 in the Monster Energy Invitational. I think it was probably the first tournament where we got to see you guys coming out aggressively, showing us what this new team is going to do. Uh, it also started this strangely, uh, this strange history of you handing second places to C9, which sort of makes me laugh constantly. Um, but has almost it almost maybe a rivalry starting to, has a rivalry started to form up between EG and C9 because of this sort of first second thing you guys tend to get into a lot. It's definitely a rivalry between any teams that are good friends. Fair, um, but it's very friendly. Like it's not mm-hmm. there's no spite at all. Like we always nice because we always win, so it's easy to talk trash <laughs> just for fun. But um, uh. they they take it pretty well, and you know they give back as much as they get. They like to brag about all their online match victories, so... Nice. So, uh, let me ask you this. Before TI4, uh, North American Dota wasn't really considered anything. It, it wasn't considered a, an area that a rise of a world-class team would come from. Um, it was kind of, I don't know, in a lot of ways a little bit of a joke. Obviously, EG has disproven that in a incredible way. And in an interview, actually, in TI4, you said that you don't believe that the NA region is strong. Do you still feel that way at, at this point in the season? Um, excluding us, there's a couple of teams that are kind of up and coming. I think the Complexity team has a lot of potential. I think the new Navi US with Ush has a lot of potential. Mm. Um, SNA has always been kind of on the fence for me, but you know they seem to be doing a little bit better mm. um, in terms of international competition. And I, I do think that the NA Dota scene is pretty underdeveloped, but there's also a lot less players. Which right. kind of makes sense, because um, the whole time zone thing, like competitively, it's just really hard to play, and there's also like a lot more kind of gaming things going on. Like console gaming is huge in the US, so it takes away a lot yeah. of the players. Absolutely. Um, what else? Like, oh, I, I said that, but it's more of just like um, I just don't think anybody's really gone out of their way to like be incredibly successful. I see. So uh, you brought up Complexity Gaming, which is uh, that's actually a team that we had. Spindle Melons was on the show a couple of weeks ago and talked about their training regimen and some other things that they do. Uh, and they've been doing better and better on the scene. I wanted to ask you, were you aware that Swindle Melons states you as his inspiration for returning to Dota? Uh, or do I, think gaming I, I think I read it on one of his like initial interviews when he like came into the seat. Like, oh, if, if PPD can do this well, why can't I? Which, <laughs> and, that's great. I, I'm glad I'm an inspiration to all of those <laughs> Han transitionals. So what did you think about that when you heard that comment, if PPD can do this, so can I? I mean, uh, no, it, does, it doesn't surprise me, to be honest. I, I, I kind of knew it was coming eventually, and I knew those guys would eventually be here, even mm-hmm. though they said they would never come to Han- or never switch to Dota. I knew they were fools, so right? best, of, best of luck to them. And um, they actually they actually 2 owed us earlier this week, which was... I mean, we 3 owed them like the day before, but... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, props to them. They played really well. They got the bloody nine guy, who's someone yeah. that I think has great potential. Um, yeah. Very, um, 
what's the word ambitious player which is something yep. that if you don't have ambition in this kind of esport thing especially as a player who's just starting out you're not going to get there yeah no bloody nines definitely made the most i think of his chance to stand in for riser while he was injured so definitely props to him on that um run through a quick shift in gears uh, a couple quick questions for you before we run into fan questions uh towards the back end of the interview do you think that a player's union is a necessity with the growing sport okay um yeah, I think so. I think there will definitely be a players' union. Hopefully, if somebody, there just needs to be someone that wants to step up and organize it, and that's something I would love to do. I just, I just don't have the time. Right. Um, and it's very like every like people like think like oh gaming, you know, it's oh it's just a hobby. Like oh mm -hmm. you can you have so much free time. I don't have so much free time. I literally wake up, play matches, then I go eat dinner, and then I stream for six hours, and then I sleep, and then I do the same thing the next day. So. When I, when I have the time, I would love to get started on it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to need, like, a week or two of, like, vacation in order for, like, me to get something, like, that big done. Right. So, tech, so it's probably not going to happen until after the next TI when the breaks come through, um, if Maybe. you were the one to do it. Though, somebody else could step up. I mean, it sounds think, like a lot of players want this. I don't think we're going to wait that long for it. I'm okay. pretty sure it's coming. It's actually really good to hear. I'm excited about that. Uh, someone on Twitter actually made a joke when I asked for questions about asking you whether or not you know any pro players who use quote unquote performance enhancing drugs. I laughed at it and then I thought, well, let me ask this. Do you think that this, it could be a real thing in esports? Is there potential for performance enhancing drugs within the esports community? Um, you know, I've never done like drugs that would increase my mental capacity. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't imagine it'd be a problem. Okay. I guess, like, what, the Gatorall is, like, the big thing, so maybe, I don't know, I've never used it, so. Okay, and then, uh, do you think, and this is the final one of these kind of questions, is an oversight board sort of like an, a FIFA or an NFL or some sort of overarching agency to sort of oversee international tournaments, do you think it's a necessary evil as Dota 2 continues to grow, or can we survive without it? Um, necessary evil is kind of a rough way to put it, I'm not exactly sure if it's entirely bad thing i think there's a lot of benefits to having like an nfl or or nascar type agency behind um a sport and there's a reason why those things exist and it's not because of like greed and um consumerism and mm -hmm. capitalism and stuff like that it's it, in a lot of ways they make a lot of sense and yeah there are some you know there are some negatives as well with that's with anything to make it more public but you know ideally something like that would bring it a lot more mainstream and a lot more people would watch and there'd be a lot more money and then there'd be a lot more jobs in the scene so um take the good with the bad right and you know i think we're probably a bit away from something incredibly huge like that mm -hmm. and it might not even be for dota 2 but maybe like dota 3 or maybe right. the next big game that comes out league of legends is already kind of doing it in-house with riot right but it's um, that's not obviously not ideal for like a lot of reasons, and I don't really want to get into that. Um, but th there's a yeah, there's definitely a lot of potential for something like that. Um, it's just we're gonna have to wait and see. And then the biggest thing is you got to get all the players behind it because if there's like a couple like top teams that aren't behind it, and then they're not gonna play in the tournaments, and people aren't gonna watch the tournaments, and mm -hmm. you know if you get a majority of people to agree to an idea like that, then it'll happen. But it just takes time. Absolutely. I mean, really, all you need is coordination. So, uh, interesting. Thank you for those answers. Let's move into some things that we've pulled off of uh, viewers or fans have sent me questions that they want to hear from you, as well as observations that I've sort of brought up. Uh, the first one that I thought was interesting is that v video log or video blog, whatever you call that, uh, for Starlighter 10. People loved it. The, the feedback we got on it was phenomenal. Everyone I talked to was like, man, you got to see this, this vlog. It was great. Uh, is that something that you plan on doing for tournaments in the future? Yeah, I've done it for three different tournaments now. I think uh, the Starletter one is the one that everyone really got to see mm -hmm. and really you know, took time out of their day to watch, which mm -hmm. is surprising because it was the longest one. It was like almost 40 minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did one for WEC, which was the first one I did, and then okay. I did one for ESL New York, and then I did one for Star Ladder. And um, yeah, it's something I really like to do. I think a lot of people ask me, well, like when I stream about like all my drafts and all my ideas, and oh, how was the tournament? Oh, what'd you guys do? What'd you guys do for fun when you weren't playing? Mm -hmm. So I figured if I just compile it all into one YouTube video, and I can send people somewhere, and they can just kind of watch at their leisure. Um, it, I got a ton of positive feedback for those videos, and of course, I will continue to. 
Awesome. Uh, somebody else asked this, though. I don't know if you remember the uh, the Twitter post that you put up that predicted the, I think it was the DK draft um, that everybody went crazy for when you posted that sort of thing. Uh, oh. is, is, is that an example of how you prep out your draft sheets? Uh, is that sort of something that you write up for everything and you just don't always post because it's not always right? Or do you just keep those hidden from us and never let us know how good you actually are? Oh, I am perfectly willing with uh, telling everyone how good I am. I, I, that <laughs> I, I won't hold back there. But yeah, that's something I generally do for a lot of the like, big land tournament matches and stuff like that. So I try to play around the like especially like the first two bands and picks. Mm -hmm. If I can kind of get an idea of how those are going to go, then I can kind of develop a game plan um, prior to the game, which mm -hmm. you know saves me a lot of time of just like coming up with this like random ass idea in the middle of the, in the middle of the um, drafting phase. So if I can like predict the first two picks, then it's really helpful. And generally, teams are pretty predictable, um, especially when you fall into a meta where like all these people are like picking the same thing, and that generally happens at big tournaments. Like for example, Star Ladder. Like we knew, like if we didn't take Elder Titan, Secret would take it, or if we didn't take Tidehunter, Secret would definitely take it. Right. So, so. leading into that, uh, Jigzy over on Reddit asked me to ask you about your drafting system. And if you, if there's any of this stuff that's like super secret, you don't want to talk about. Feel free to just no comment or f you or whatever feels comfortable. Uh, but do you start your drafts with a single hero in mind, like say? Uh, a Lycan or a Void for Universe and then build your draft around that if you get it? Or do you prefer to start banning and picking according to the other team's heroes? So more of a reactive style. Uh, I think kind of, I think every hero is play, are able to play against. I think, yeah, I'd say you can play against any hero. Um, so you just have to have an idea around it. So like say, hey, I think the best way to go about it is say, hey, this game I'm going to give up, for, like whoever has first picks, like, hey, I'm going to give up first pick Panda. Or I'm gonna give up Wisp, or I'm gonna let them have Tide Under. But you know, the question is, how are you gonna beat it? And you have to, you know, really have that in the back of your mind when they first pick that hero, and you have to start devising a strategy to beat that hero, because that first hero that they pick is definitely gonna be a good one. Makes sense. Yeah, no, makes perfect sense to me. Uh, moving past that, Jay Goth over on Reddit asked, why do you feel like your Dota 2 career has been so much more successful than your Han career? Do you actually feel that way, or uh, and if so, what do you think the difference has been? Good question. Um, I think, first off, I think Han players are very good. Mm -hmm. I think the skill and skill sets that we had to develop in Han mm -hmm. are above and beyond what the average Dota player was um, in order to you know be relevant in that game. Um, but I think, for me personally. I think I'm very lucky and very fortunate. I think that um, I've been put into a, I've been, I've been placed into a great opportunity to succeed with great teammates. I think that um, individually, I've been able to become more confident in my ability to lead and captain a team, which I think is uh, one of the big things that I would attribute to my and our success. Um, I think that. Dropping out of school, I still have a, I still have a, like almost three semesters left. I okay. think freeing up that time has let me really focus on just Dota, mm -hmm. and I think the money in the scene is really just you know it, it lets me, it lets it, it, first off it lets me be more, be more confident, right. myself as a person, and it's you know like like previously it gives me time it gives me the time to do whatever I need to do in order to be the most successful. Makes sense. Let me ask you on a side note, how did your parents feel about dropping out of school to focus on Dota or Han or video games in general? Um, well, when my grades and stuff started to uh, slip and I started making up bullshit excuses to skip class, um, they were kind of very disapproving. But once I started to make like, you know, good money, then they were like, hey, you know, if, if you can make this work, good for you. Follow your dreams. Excellent. Uh, so that was a little question for me. Uh, keep rolling down this list of questions because there's some good ones in here. So, uh, Kintsu asks, do you think that Arteezy's play style fits more farm-centric heroes, or do you think he's going to be a tempo control hero sort of guy moving forward in this meta? Um, you know, it just really depends what we think is good at the moment. I think nice. he can, you know, he loves playing carries. Like, we even put him on the safe lane a lot of time on, like, Spectre or Weaver or Naga or something like that, and... It just depends, like, what he wants to do, and 
it depends what he's most comfortable with at the current moment because a lot of times I'll say hey Artur do you want to play this he goes no I don't want to play that and he's like let Fear as I play that and then mm. I go okay and then if I'm like Artur do you want to play this and he goes yeah I'm feeling it let's do this <laughs> so I just you know I nice. picked Storm Spirit the other day for him probably like first time in eight months probably yeah. that we picked Storm Spirit or for at least for him it used mm-hmm. to like exclusively be a Mason hero and then we haven't played it since TI right and um you know, he says, you know what, he, I said, hey, you want to play Storm Spirit? And he goes, yeah, I, I can go for a Storm Spirit game. So I said, all right, let's do it. Nice. Uh, is there a, what player on the team? So I assume that during the drafting phase, you would kind of ask that question to folks as you go through the draft and pick heroes that work. Who on the team is the most flexible? That They're like, just give me anything. Like, I don't even care. I'll just rock it. Fear or has the, fear probably Zai. Okay. No, Fear and Zai. Fear and Zai. Those two will play any hero I ask them to. I say, Hey, you, you guys want to play this? And they go, uh, sure, 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 sure. Because what we do is, because we're able to swap Fear and Zai around. Like, some mm-hmm. games Fear can play support if if he doesn't want to play one of the carry heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure he likes playing support, so he's kind of learned or accepted of, to play any kind of core that I pick for him, so Zai doesn't get his hands on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, those two will play anything I pick them, and it's nice because I almost have like a fourth core in Zai so I could like send him into the jungle or I could put him into the off lane and then let the universe or fear jungle or something so it's it's cool yeah they're very flexible that's awesome um, so in past interviews you said that leadership is a large part of what sets EG apart from everybody else clearly it's working do you have any advice for aspiring team captains or leaders people who are sort of trying to get their team out of the drudgery of that tier 3 tier 2 experience uh, to help them get to the next level Okay. Oh, well, there's a lot of other great captains as well, so I don't want to put that aside. Like, there's, um, you know, a lot of other teams have great leadership, and that's the reason why they're successful. Mm-hmm. But EG, you know, I think we have pretty decent leadership, which allows us to really be um, focused and become successful. And my advice to anyone that is trying to aspire to become a leader, I think that, um, like I said previously, confidence is a big thing, and you have to not only be confident in yourself, but you need your teammates to be confident in you as well. So whether that means you need to prove yourself in a big way, uh, you know, maybe you got to step up and do something big. Nice. So get the confidence of your troops. It's a cl- classic idea all the way back to, uh, say, uh, what was his name? Art of War. Uh, I mean, all the way up to General MacArthur. Every history, every military history you read, they talk about that. I'm glad to see you've embraced it. Now let's talk about something else that came out recently that had an interesting polarizing reaction, and that's a YouTube video that you released uh, that I actually enjoyed quite a lot, uh, all about uh, just your, it was sort of a, what do you want to call it, a compilation of salty moments, if you will. It's got over 12,000 views to date. Has How has feedback been? Has it been mostly positive or, or not so great? Um, well, everybody will always pitchfork, uh, just for the sake of pitchforking, mm-hmm. but I've had a lot of a, well, a lot of both, I think. Probably more positive than negative, to be completely fair. Um, but, yeah, that, that whole video is just kind of like an experiment kind of thing. Like, me and my friend Ben are really working at developing, like, other parts of my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, just in terms of, like, branding, like, YouTube, like, blogging, vlogging, right. uh, my Twitch stream as well. So, it's kind of more of, like, just an experiment to see how a video like that would go. And uh, I think... Uh, we're kind of like debating whether or not we want to do another and we're pretty in between because I do I do kind of rage on stream sometimes and I, I thought people enjoyed it just because it was for fun and mm-hmm. you know most of my teammates don't really actually get mad at me when I'm doing it because mm-hmm. um, I'm just kind of joking I think they can understand that if they're actually like right. watching and watching the game and kind of like understanding my sense of humor but I do understand how some people would be offended mm-hmm. by it, and I, you know, watching my VODs to try and find moments, I said, hey, you know, I definitely shouldn't have said that. Right. So, uh, I, it kind of makes sense to me. Um, but the video, it's, I liked it. I think it's funny. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's hilarious. And I think, but it's a little heavy for some people, I think, and that's, that's okay. It's not for everyone. Um, I tried to say, hey, you guys, um, I know this video wasn't, like, exactly what everyone would like to see so, mm-hmm. but um we're probably going to try and keep it a little more friendly in the future and maybe just have it have like kind of like a salty kind of thing but have it like less like less fuck you and less or more just you know having fun and laughing yeah i mean i don't think any of us would mind seeing you be salty on your camera it just doesn't necessarily have to get typed out but do you think that the 
this is a byproduct of your growth as a popular figure in esports. I mean, six months ago, or even before that, when let's let's go back to SSD before you got on with Sad Boys at the beginning of EG. If you had got released this sort of video as a less famous, less popular Dota two personality. Do you think the backlash would have been the same, or do you think it's the fact that you're in the spotlight pretty much permanently now that would ca that causes that backlash? Probably the spotlight that's made it so um, controversial, mm -hmm. just because I have a much bigger audience that sees everything, and you know, when one person sees it, they'll share it somewhere else, and then right. they'll share it somewhere else, and then they'll share it somewhere else, and then they'll, you know, they'll be kind enough to come into my stream and you know let me know what their thoughts are there. So. Um, yeah, it's it's fun because you know I have such a, a big audience and I can see all these people's reactions and mm -hmm. I do enjoy that. But sometimes you know I don't get the reaction I really want, which makes me very disappointed because we did put a lot of hard work into that video and mm -hmm. you know my friend Ben put in like hours and hours of editing onto that video and it's you know I'm glad some people enjoyed it, but it was disappointing to see some negative feedback. Right. Uh... So we'll get let's get move into a, a question I found was I thought was entertaining. Junk Widget asked this on Reddit. Uh, I uh, I like to ask a random silly question in an interview just for fun, and this is a good one. He said, "If you were to have someone on your team, if someone on your team had to perform surgery, let's say open heart surgery on you, who would you choose from your team to take that job?" That's a pretty easy question. I think I'd probably go with Universe. I mean, he's okay. Indian, so naturally he's like he was like almost a doctor already. I think. Right. Birth, birth is a doctor. Uh, pretty steady hands. Who, who? So along those lines, do you think that he's the best under pressure situations, or who on oh, your who on your uh, team handles the highest pressure situations the best? Tough question. Tough question. Um, I think. I. It's a tough. It's a tough question. I think we all perform pretty well under pressure, which makes us a very successful land mm -hmm. team. Online tournaments, we don't have the best performances just because I, I don't think people are focused as, as much as they would mm -hmm. be and I think a lot of people just like we have a lot of issues of like just like being focused and actually mm -hmm. like trying our best in online matches and we like to like pick uh, I like to pick like really weird things it leads to some very um, questionable results and you know even, we do get mad about them like mm -hmm. think hey why the hell are we doing this like what are we doing like we should we should be winning these matches like why are we not trying our best and um, because we know how good we are, and when right. we don't reach up to our potential, it's like, what the hell are we doing? Like, this is our day job. Like, we get paid, you know, tons of money to play a video game. Like, why are we not doing our best? Like, that's ridiculous. Um, so, but the high pressure situations, I think, I think if I'm in like a big tournament, I think the best way I can answer this question, I'll, I'll try and answer it this way is, um, if we're in a big tournament and I need to win a game, and we're in a, we're facing elimination. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put Zai on a do shit hero, and I'm gonna say Zai, go win us this game. Nice. And you know he does it. So that's a I'll great answer. Him. That's a great answer. The do shit hero thing is quotable. Uh, so let me ask you this: You talked about living up to your full potential, sometimes clowning a bit on drafts. Uh, what do you think about the XMG Captains Draft Tournament and your performance in it thus far? Well, that tournament's pretty difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been letting we've been letting Zai draft for the most right. part. I mean, we obviously we offer our input and he listens to it, but I think the whole like online tournament, it's kind of like it's. I mean, it's kind of a fun tournament, but it's so much money now. Right. So it's like, is it really for fun? And right. And um, you know, we don't do well on Luxembourg server at all. Like mm -hmm. we, I think we're like four and four. In Captain's Draft, and we've lost all four games on Lux, and we've won all four games on US East. So, Makes sense. I think we, I think in order to make the playoffs, we need to continue splitting and then win like one game on Lux. So we have to mm -hmm. two zero somebody. I'm not sure. Hopefully, hopefully it's soon. Um, but <coughs> yeah, just it's 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 really tough for our US West guys to play on Luxembourg servers. It, it just it's not good. Has and a sorry, go ahead. It's the same thing for Russian players or like Europe East players playing on US East. Like it's it's just really difficult. Right. So, do you think that the change in and somebody expressed something right? Do you think the change in prize pool has actually sucked sort of the fun out of the captain's draft tournament? Because it felt I don't know when it started, it felt kind of clowny and entertaining on a lot of team, a lot of teams just sort of having a good time with it, and it started to feel a lot more serious lately. Do you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing? Um, 
that's probably um, what's the word? Pretty what subjective? I think depending Fair. on like the team and depending on the person watching. Personally, I think it's probably it's cool that there's so much support behind the tournament, mm-hmm. but I don't think that the increased prize pool is going to make it you know less serious and more fun. I think mm-hmm. the higher that prize pool goes up, then the less serious or the more serious it's going to be, which is maybe unfortunate. It depends mm-hmm. like what their goal was when they made the tournament. I'm not sure what it was, but I for if I know Suns fan and Cinder, it was probably just to have fun. Right. And I think that the increased prize pool is. Um, Know, leading away from that kind of idea. Fair enough. All right, so that's uh, those are the questions I put together for you. That's I think I think we got a lot of good stuff in there. So thank you very much uh, for being here, guys. For those of you watching live, thank you very much for being here to watch. Uh, the show will be live uh, Wednesday morning with the fresh coffee with Toffees. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you hit the follow. Follow me at Toffees underscore Dota two. Um, or as always, if you want to support the show, patreon.com slash toffees is how we keep the sponsors out so that we can literally talk about anything we want with no rules or regulations here on the show. Uh, PPD, you've been wonderful. It's probably one of the easier interviews that I've done. So thank you for that. Uh, do you have any final shout outs or thoughts that you want to share with those watching? Um, no, just shout out to everyone who's here, um, supporting the show. I think you do a great job. And uh, shout out to anyone who watches my Twitch stream. And your Twitch stream is APD. Um, hope to hope to see you guys there. Maybe if you you know if you have uh, people that haven't watched my stream before, mm-hmm. and you, you know think oh this salty PPD XD. No, please come <laughs> check it out. I'm not. It's really not that bad. And uh, you just just give me a chance. Just give me a chance, guys. So for those of you who don't get to watch PPD very often, that's what we want. We want you to plug in a chance to see him as he actually is. You said it's twitch.tv slash PPD, right? Yep, that is the one. Easy, simple. He got it first before anybody else could steal it. So check it out. Uh, Support the stream. Listen to him salt for yourself because that's the way that it should be done. Guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, PPD, thanks for joining us. It's been a great interview. It's been a great day. Play more Dota. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, 